the world is old and can have changed but little since man arose in it, else man himself would have perished. Why, then, should he still live without a sure and sufficient philosophy? The equivalent of such a philosophy is probably hereditary and sundry animals not much older than man. They have had time to take the measure of life and have settled down to a routine of preferences and habits which keeps their heads as a race above water and they are presumably visited at appropriate seasons by magic images which are symbols to them for the world or for the cycles of their destiny. Among groups of men, an equilibrium of this moral sort has been sometimes approached. In India and in China, under the Muslim or the Catholic regimens. And if socialist or other panaceas now exercise such a strange influence over men's hearts, it is perhaps because they are impatient of being so long the sport of diverse ignorant dogmas and chance adventures and aspire to live in a stable harmony with nature. In fact, beneath these various complete systems which have profess but fail to be universal, there is actually a dumb human philosophy, incomplete but solid, prevalent among all civilized people. They all practice agriculture, commerce, and mechanical arts, with artificial instruments lately very much complicated. And they necessarily possess with these arts a modicum of sanity, morality, and science requisite for carrying them on, and tested by success in doing so. Is not this human confidence philosophy enough? Is it not at least the nucleus of all sound philosophy? In spite of the superficial confusion reigning in the world, is not the universal wisdom of the future actually gathering about this human confidence in engineering and chemistry and medicine and war? It might seem so, since the sort of knowledge involved in the arts, though it may not go very far, is compulsory so far as it goes, and being sanctioned by success. It ought to be permanent and progressive. There is indeed a circle of material events called nature, to which all minds belonging to the same society are responsive in common. Not to be responsive to these facts is simply to be stupid and backward in the arts. Those who explore and master their environment cannot help learning what it is. In this direction, competence involves enlightenment. Among minds forming a moral society, and able to compare their several opinions, this enlightenment in the expert is coercive over the layman also, because the same facts confront them both. Did not the same facts confront them, communication would be impossible between them, or if communication was reputed to exist by magic, there would be no possible conflict or progress among their opinions, because they would not refer to the same events. Even if each declared himself confident and prosperous in his own world, he would know nothing of the world of his neighbors. Their several minds would simply be variously or similarly brilliant, like jewels signifying nothing to one another. If any mind hopes to address another, or even itself, persuasively, as I now wish to address the reader in my own thoughts, he must assume a single system of events to which both minds are responsive and which includes their respective bodies and actions. Material events will arouse in them intuitions conformable to their several stations, faculties, and passions, and their active nature, since they are animals, not plants, will compel them to regard many of the essences so given in intuition as signs for the environment in which they move modifying this environment and affected by it. This assumption justifies itself at every turn in practice and establishes in the habits of all men in proportion to their confidence an appropriate adjustment to the realm of matter and in their imagination a suitable picture of the same. 
Nevertheless, since the station, faculties, and passions of all men are not identical, these pictures will not be similar. Different observers may be addressed to different regions of nature or sensitive to different elements in the same region. Thus, dwellers in distinct planets must evidently have distinct geographies and the same battle in the clouds will be known to the deaf only as lightning and to the blind only as thunder, each responding to a different constituent of the total event and not simultaneously. So an eclipse itself, but one aspect of a constellation of events in the heavens may be known in various entirely different terms by calculation before it occurs, by sense when it is occurring, by memory immediately afterwards, and by reports to posterity. All these indications are entirely inadequate to the facts they reveal in the realm of matter, and qualitatively unlike those facts. They are a set of variegated symbols by which sensitive animals can designate them. Of course, the existence and use of such language is an added fact in nature, a fact so important and close to the egotism of the animals themselves as perhaps to obscure all else in their eyes. Their instinct indeed keeps their attention stretched upon the material world that actually surrounds them, but sometimes sensation and language, instead of being passed over like the ticking of the telegraph, may become objects in themselves in all their absolute musical insignificance, and then animals become idealists. The terms in which they describe things, unlike the things they meant to describe, are purely spacious, arbitrary, and ideal. Whether visual, tactile, auditory, or conceptual, these terms are essentially words. They possess intrinsically in their own ontological plane only logical or ascetic being, and this contains no indication whatever of the material act of speaking touching, or looking, which causes them to appear. All possible terms in mental discourse are essences existing nowhere, visionary equally, whether the faculty that discovers them be sense or thought or the most fantastic fancy. Such diversity in animal experience taken in itself exhibits sundry qualities or forms of being, a part of the infinite multitude of distinguishable ideal terms which, whether ever revealed to anybody or not, I call the realm of essence. Pure intuition in its poetic ecstasy would simply drink in such of these essences as happen to present themselves, but for a wakeful animal, they are signals. They report to his spirit in very summary and uncertain images the material events which surround him and which concern his welfare. They may accordingly become terms in knowledge if interpreted judiciously, and if interpreted injudiciously, they may become illusions. The dumb philosophy of the human animal, by which he rears his family and practices the arts and finds his way home, might take definite shape and establish a healthy routine in all his dealings with matter, which include society, and yet his imaginative experience might retain all its spacious originality. The control which the environment exercises over the structure and conduct of animals is decidedly loose. They can live dragging a long chain of idle tricks, diseases, and obsolete organs, and even this loose control fails almost entirely in the case of alternative senses or languages, one of which may serve as well as another. Many species survive together, many rival endowments and customs and religions, and the same control fails altogether in regard to the immaterial essences which those senses or languages call up before the mind's eye. Adaptation is physical, and it is only the material operation in sensation or speech that can possibly be implicated in the clockwork of nature. The choice of those visionary essences which meantime visit the mind, though regular, is free. They are the transcript of life into discourse. 
the rhetorical and emotional rendering of existence, which when deepened and purified becomes poetry or music. There can be no reason why differences in these spheres, even among men of the same race, should not be perpetual. It would be mere sluggishness and egotism to regret it. Such differences are not merely added like a vain luxury to a sane recognition in other conscious terms of the facts of nature. The sane response to nature is by action only and by an economy which nature can accept and weave into her own material economy. But as to the terms of sense and discourse, they are all from the very beginning equally arbitrary, poetical, and if you choose mad, yet all equally symptomatic. They vary initially and intangibly from mind to mind, even in expressing the same routine of nature, the imagination which eventually runs to fine art or religion is the same faculty which, under a more direct control of external events, yields vulgar perception. The promptings and the control exercised by matter are continuous in both cases. The dream requires a material dreamer as much as the waking sensation and the latter is a transcript of his bodily condition just as directly as the dream. Poetic, creative, original fantasy is not a secondary form of sensibility, but its first and only form. The same manual restlessness and knack which makes man a manufacturer of toys makes him, when by chance his toys prove useful, a manufacturer of implements. Fine art is thus older than servile labor and the poetic quality of experience is more fundamental than its scientific value. The existence may revert at any moment to play, and may run down in idleness, but it is impossible that any work or discovery should ever come about without the accompaniment of pure contemplation, if there is consciousness at all, so that the inherent freedom of the spirit can never be stamped out so long as spirit endures nor is it safe to imagine that inspired people, because they dream awake in their philosophy, must come to grief in the real world. The great religious and political systems, which I mentioned above, have had brilliant careers. Their adepts have been far from making worse soldiers than skeptics make, or worse workmen than materialists nor have they committed suicide or been locked up in the madhouse more often than exact philosophers. Nature drives with a loose rein, and the vitality of any sort, even if expressed in fancy, can blunder through many a predicament in which reason would despair. And if the mythical systems decline at last, it is not so much by virtue of the maladjustments underlying their speculative errors for their myths as a whole are wisely contrived as because imagination in its freedom abandons these errors for others simply because the prevalent mood of mankind has changed and it begins dreaming in a different key. Spirit bloweth where it listeth and continually undoes its own work. This world of free expression, this drift of sensation, passions, and ideas perpetually kindled and fading in the light of consciousness, I call the realm of spirit. It is only for the sake of this free life that material confidence and knowledge of fact are worth attaining. Facts for a living creature are only instruments. His play life is his true life. On his working days, when he is attentive to matter, he is only his own servant, preparing the feast. He becomes his own master in his holidays and in his sportive passions. Among these must be counted literature and philosophy, and so much of love, religion, and patriotism as is not an effort to survive materially. In such enthusiasms there is much as servation, but 
what they attest is really not the character of the external facts concerned, but only the spiritual uses to which the spirit turns them. A philosopher cannot wish to be deceived. This philosophy is a declaration of policy in the presence of the facts, and therefore his first care must be to ascertain and heartily to acknowledge all such facts as are relevant to his action or sentiment, not less and not necessarily more. The pursuit of truth is a form of courage, and a philosopher may well love truth for its own sake, and that he is disposed to confront destiny, whatever it may be, with zest when possible, with resignation when necessary, and not seldom with amusement. The facts to which it is prudent and noble in him to bear his bosom are the morally relevant facts, such as touch his fortunes or his heart, or such as he can alter by his efforts nor can he really discover other facts. Intuition or absolute apprehension without media or doubt is proper to spirit perusing essences. It is impossible to animals confronting facts. Animals know things by expiration, reaction, and prophetic fancy. They therefore can know only such parts and depths of nature as they explore materially and respond to vitally. The brave impulse to search may indeed become eager and may wish to recognize no limits, and there may be spirits so utterly practical and serious that the pursuit of material facts absorbs them altogether to the exclusion of all play of mind, that such hectic exactitude is an expression of fear and automatic rather than rational curiosity in an animal always has limits which it is foolish to transgress because beyond them theory insensibly lapses into verbal myths and if still taken for true knowledge defeats the honest curiosity that inspired it what renders knowledge true is fidelity to the object but in the conduct and fancy of an animal this fidelity can be only rough summary dramatic too much refinement renders it subjective, as does too much haste. This is true of mathematical refinements no less than of verbal pedantries. The realm of matter can never be disclosed either to hypothesis or to sensation in its presumable inmost structure and ultimate extent. The garment of appearance must always fit it loosely and drape it in alien folds because appearance is essentially an adaptation of facts to the scale and faculty of the observer. There are also moral limits to seriousness and utter literalness in thought. The tragic compulsion to honor the fact is imposed on man by the destiny of his body to which that of his mind is attached. But his destiny is not the only thing possible to his thought, nor the most congenial. The best part of his destiny is that he may often forget it, and existence would not be worth preserving if it had to be spent exclusively in anxiety about existence. It follows from all this that knowledge of facts merely because they are facts cannot be the ultimate object of a philosopher although he must wish to know the whole unvarnished truth about relative, relevant matters. A liberal mind must live on its own terms and think in them. It is not inferior to what surrounds it. Fact worship on its part would accordingly be a fault in taste and in morals. What is the function of philosophy? To disclose the absolute truth. But is it credible that the absolute truth should descend into the thoughts of a mortal creature equipped with a few special senses and with a biased intellect, a man lost amidst millions of his fellows and a prey to the epidemic delusions of the race? Possession of the absolute truth 
is not merely by accident beyond the range of particular minds. It is incompatible with being alive because it excludes any particular station, organ, interest, or date of survey. The absolute truth is undiscoverable just because it is not a perspective. Perspectives are essential to animal apprehension. An observer himself, a part of the world he observes, must have a particular station in it. He cannot be equally near to everything, nor internal to anything but himself. Of the rest, he can only take views, abstracted according to his sensibility and foreshortened according to his interest. Those animals which I was supposing endowed with an adequate philosophy surely do not possess the absolute truth. They read nature in their private idioms. Their imagination, like the human, is doubtless incapable of coping with all things at once, or even with the whole of anything natural. Mind was not created for the sake of discovering the absolute truth. The absolute truth has its own intangible reality, and scorns to be known. The function of mind is rather to increase the wealth of the universe in the spiritual dimension by adding appearance to substance and passion to necessity, and by creating all those private perspectives and those emotions of wonder, adventure, curiosity, and laughter which omniscience would exclude. If omniscience were alone respectable, creation would have been a mistake. The single duty of all creatures would then be to repair that creative error by abolishing their several senses and desires and becoming indistinguishable from one another and from nothing at all. And if all creation could attain to this sort of salvation, the absolute substance in whose honor all else had been abandoned will become unconscious. The time will doubtless come for each of us, if not for the universe at large, to cease from care, but our passage through life will have added a marvelous episode to the tale of things, and our distinction and glory, as well as our sorrow, will have lain in being something in particular, and in knowing what it is. Thus, if there is a sense in which all special and separable existence is illusion, there is another sense in which illusion is itself a special and separable existence. And if this be condemned for not being absolute substance or for excluding knowledge of the absolute truth, it may also be prized for these very reasons. Sensation is true enough. All experience yields some acquaintance with the realm of essence and some perspective of the material world. And this would always be a true perspective since things seen at that angle and with that organ really look like that. If the appearance were not stretched to cover more than it covers in reality. Of such true perspectives, the simplest and most violently foreshortened may be as good as the most complicated. The most poetical or pictorial as good as the most scientific, not only aesthetically but even cognitively, because it may report the things concerned on that human scale on which we need to measure them, and this relation may report them correctly. Nor is the error which such very partial knowledge may breed when avoided by precipitate judgments and vanity altogether unavoidable. The variety of senses in man the precarious rule of his instincts and the range of his memory and fancy give rise in him eventually to some sense of error and even of humor. He is almost able to pierce the illusions of his animal dogmatism, to surrender the claim to inspiration, and in one sense to transcend the relativity of his knowledge and the flightiness of his passions by acknowledging them with a good grace. This relativity does not imply that there is no absolute truth. On the contrary, if there were no absolute truth, all inclusive and eternal, the desultory views taken from time to time by individuals would themselves be absolute. They would be irrelevant to one another and incomparable in point of truth, each being without any object but the essence which appeared in it. The views can be more or less correct and perhaps complementary to one another is because they refer to the same system of nature, the complete description of which, covering the whole past and the whole future, would be the absolute truth. This absolute truth is no living view, no actual judgment, 
but merely that segment of the realm of essence which happens to be illustrated in existence. The question whether a given essence belongs to this segment or not, that is, whether a suggested idea is or is not true, has a tragic importance for an animal intent on discovering and describing what exists or has existed or is destined to exist in his world. He seldom has leisure to dwell on essences apart from their presumable truth. Even their beauty and dialectical pattern seem to him rather trivial, unless they are significant of facts in the realm of matter controlling human destiny. I therefore give a special name to this tragic segment of the realm of essence and call it the realm of truth. The knowledge of relevant truth, while it has this fundamental moral importance, is far from being our only concern in the life of reason. It comes in only incidentally, so far as a staunch and comprehensive knowledge of things makes a man master of things independent of them in a great measure. The business of a philosopher is rather to be a good shepherd of his thoughts. The share of attention and weight which he gives to physical speculation or to history or to psychology will express his race and disposition or the spirit of his time. Everyone is free to decide how far material arts and sciences are worth pursuing and with what free creations they shall be surrounded. Young and ardent minds and races without accumulated possessions tend to poetry and metaphysics. They neglect or falsify the truth in the heat of their imaginative passion. Old men and old nations inclined to mix their wine with larger delusions of reality, and they prefer history, biography, politics, and humorous fiction, because in all these, while the facts are neither conceived nor tested scientifically, the savor of earth and of experience remains dominant. By the philosopher, however, both the homeliest brew and the most meticulous science are only relished as food for the spirits. Even if defeated in the pursuit of truth, the spirit may be victorious in self-expression and self-knowledge, and if a philosopher could be nothing else, he might still be a moralist or a poet. He would do well to endow his vision of things with all the force, color, and scope of which his soul is capable. Then, if he misses the truth of nature, as in many things is probable, he will at least have achieved a work of imagination. In such a case, the universe, without being mapped as a whole in the fancy, will be enriched. At one point, for the happy life enacted there, in one human focus of art and vision, the purer and more distinct the spirit which a philosopher can bring to light in his thoughts, the greater the intellectual achievement, and the greater the moral achievement also, if the policy so set forth is actually carried out in his whole life and conversation. As for me, in stretching my canvas and taking up my palette and brush, I am not vexed that masters should have painted before me in styles which I have no power and no occasion to imitate, nor do I expect future generations to be satisfied with always repainting my pictures. Agreement is sweet, being a form of friendship is also a stimulus to insight and helpful as contradiction is not and i certainly hope to find agreement in some quarters yet i am not much concerned about the number of those who may be my friends in spirit nor do i care about their chronological distribution being as much pleased to discover one intellectual kinsman in the past as to imagine two in the future that in the world at large alien natures should prevail innumerable and perhaps infinitely various does not disturb me. On the contrary, I hope fate may manifest to them such objects as they need and can love, and although my sympathy with them cannot be so vivid as with men of my own mind, and in some cases may pass into antipathy, I do not conceive that they are wrong or inferior for being different from me or from one another. If God and nature can put up with them, why should I raise an objection? But let them take care, for if they have sinned against the facts, as I suppose is often the case, and are kicking against the pricks of matter, they must expect 
to be brought to confusion on the day of doom or earlier. Not only will their career be brief and troubled, which is the lot of all flesh, but their faith will be stultified by events, which is a needless and eternal ignominy for the spirit. But if somehow, in their chosen terms, they have balanced their accounts with nature, they are to be heartily congratulated on their moral diversity. It is pleasant to think that the fertility of spirit is inexhaustible if matter only gives it a chance, and that the worst and most successful fanaticism cannot turn the moral world permanently into a desert. The pity of it is only that contrary souls should often fight for the same bodies, natural or political, as if space and matter and the universe were inadequate as on earth indeed they are. For every essence in its own time is to see the sun, but existence is precipitate and blind. It cannot bide its time, and the seeds of form are often so wantonly and thickly scattered that they strangle one another, call one another weeds and tares, and can live only in the distracted effort to keep others from living. Seldom does any soul live through a single and lovely summer in its native garden, suffered in contented bloom. Philosophers and nations cannot be happy unless separate. Then they may be single-minded at home and tolerant abroad. If they have a spirit in them which is worth cultivating, which is not always the case, they need to entrench it in some concentrated citadel where it may come to perfect expression. Human beings allowed to run loose are vowed to perdition, since they are too individual to agree and too gregarious to stand alone. Hence the rareness of any polity founded on wisdom, like that of which ancient Greece affords some glimpses, and the equal rareness of a pure and complete philosophy, such as that of Dante or of Spinoza, conceived in some moment of wonderful unanimity or of fortunate isolation. My own philosophy, I venture to think, is well meant in the same sense, in spite of perhaps seeming eclectic and of leaving so many doors open, both in physics and in morals. My eclecticism is not helplessness before sundry influences. It is detachment and firmness in taking each thing simply for what it is. Openness, too, is a form of architecture. The doctrine that all Moralities equally are but expressions of animal life is a tremendous dogma, at once blessing and purging all mortal passions, and the conviction that there can be no knowledge save animal faith positing eternal facts, and that this natural science is but a human symbol for those facts, also has an immense finality. The renunciation and the assurance in it are both radical and both invincible. In confessing that I have nearly touched the hem of nature's garment, I feel that virtue from her has passed into me and made me whole. There is no more bewitching moment in childhood than when the boy to whom someone is slightly propounding some absurdity suddenly looks up and smiles. The brat has understood. A thin deception may gain practice on him, and the hope that he might not be deceived but by deriding it might prove he had attained to a man's stature and a man's wit who was but banter prompted by love. So with this thin deception practiced upon me by nature, the great sphinx in posing her riddle and looking so threatening and mysterious is secretly hoping that I may laugh. She is not a riddle but a fact. The words she whispers are not oracles but prattle. Why take her residual silence which is inevitable for a challenge or a menace. She does not know how to speak more plainly. Her secret is as great a secret to herself as to me. If I perceive it and laugh, instantly she draws in her claws. A tremor runs through her inimitable body, and if she were not of stone, she would embrace her boyish discoverer and yield herself to him altogether. It is so simple to exist, to be what one is for no reason to engulf all questions and answers in the rush of being that sustains them. Henceforth, nature and spirit can play together like mother and child, each marvelously pleasant to the other, yet deeply unintelligible. For as she created him, she knew not how, 
merely by smiling in her dreams. So in awakening and smiling back, he somehow understands her. At least, he is all the understanding she has of herself. Realms of Being Introduction For this compact edition of Realms of Being, the publishers desired a new introduction. The work had been originally issued in four separate volumes at intervals of years, but the introduction to the whole was not lacking. An elaborate one had previously appeared under the title Skepticism and Animal Faith, yet, although expressly written to introduce realms of being, this earlier book was essentially more sophisticated than the later volumes and less friendly to the fundamental convictions of mankind. As my purpose in discriminating these realms of being had been to reassert those fundamental convictions, there was a tactical circumlocution, and perhaps a misleading one, in beginning by a reductio ad absurdum of modern paradoxes. The reconstruction of common sense on that radically skeptical foundation found the reader confused and not inclined to recognize and recover his natural reason under the name of animal faith. I am therefore not sorry to see realms of being reappear without that retrospective prologue. This is not an exercise in controversy, but in meditation. It addresses itself less to the professional philosophers of the day than to the reflective moments and speculative honesty of any man in any age or country. In this spirit, I afterwards composed the briefer and more direct introduction contained in the general preface that here immediately precedes. It indicates how these kinds of reality may come to be distinguished by an animal mind in the presence of nature. Such an articulation of thought and language has nothing compulsory about it. It can be neither complete nor exclusive, and other animal minds may come to clearness differently. Mankind drowning observation in myth has gone and continues to go much farther afield than I should venture in composing religions and philosophies. I offer only a sketch of the logical and moral economy that has imposed itself on my free thoughts. Recently, by friendly solicitations coming from outside, I have been led to write a somewhat biographical and controversial apologia for my way of thinking. In volume second of the Library of Living Philosophers, Northwestern University, Evanston and Chicago, 1940. And this might serve as a third introduction to Realms of Being, perhaps the best for that part of the public which is more interested in an author's life and in what people say of him than they are in his work. Yet so labyrinthine an approach may block the way as much as it guides, and may end in utter confusion. Because of my defense, I am compelled to wander into artificial problems and hopeless misunderstandings. That, for my ultimate purpose, had better be disregarded. Each critic inevitably has his preconceptions and his characteristic blind spots, no worse doubtless than mine, but not helpful to an innocent reader who would like to understand my unadulterated doctrine. Philosophical innocence, neutrality in regard to modern professional philosophy, will indeed be a help in understanding this book, because after having cleared my own mind as much as possible of traditional sophistry, I have endeavored to recover the natural and inevitable beliefs of a human being living untutored in this world, but having a reflective mind. We need not be ignorant of the systems of mythology, religion, or philosophy that ingenious or inspired wits have constructed, as you need not be ignorant of genuine science and history. But all this will merely complicate for him in a challenging fashion the landscape of nature. His allegiance need not begin to be engaged to anything speculative until he has seen its place as an arbitrary or as an inevitable conception in the life of mankind. 
great difficulties beset any man who, in a sophisticated age, asks himself what are the inescapable elements in his own beliefs and conceptions. He has been using for years a complicated language in which contrary metaphors and logics are embedded, and the problems that have been presented to him as pressing are very likely quite accidental or perverse, such as did not arise in the clear development of intelligence. The earth, as Nietzsche said, has been too long a madhouse. We need to purify the air of all the miasmas of the past, and still more of those of the present, which are even more likely to choke us. A man so immersed in local and momentary affairs and in the interest of his profession or party as to think them fundamental either in the world or in his own heart may be most useful to the useless projects of others, but he can never be a philosopher. Technical philosophy itself abounds in unnecessary problems, which the truly wise will not trouble about, seeing that they are insoluble or solved best by not raising them. Nevertheless, it may be enlightening to study these puzzles historically, to understand, to situate, and to disinfect them. This is what I instinctively endeavored to do for many years in my reading and teaching respecting the whole of Greek and modern philosophy, not linearly or anxiously, but as the subject matter at each point might suggest to my free mind. I had no thought of constructing any rival system, yet my sincere reaction to one system after another gradually revealed to me the unformulated principles that guided my judgment, so that my system, if system it can be called, was not so much formed by me as discovered within me. A brand new system could never tempt me. I should hear the tramp of the next new system at its heels. This philosophy that I have unearthed within me is ancient philosophy, very ancient philosophy. Indeed, my endeavor in putting it into words has been to retreat to the minimum beliefs and radical presuppositions implied in facing a world at all or professing to know anything beliefs and presuppositions that it is impossible for me to deny honestly, although I may seldom or never have conceived them clearly. For when I speak of minimum beliefs and radical presuppositions, I do not in the least refer to the earliest notions in my own mind or in the minds of children or savages. My investigation is not anthropological, but critical and analytic and made in the full light of human experience and history. The notions of savages and children, if allowed to grow wild, are extravagantly fanciful and confused, and much of this confusion and extravagance seems to me to subsist in traditional philosophy. It remains superstitious in principle whenever it fails to distinguish the two elements in childish apprehension. On the one hand, the real contact with things, the cognitive intent, justified faith, and prompting to inquiry that are proper to knowledge. On the other hand, the picture of emotions and ideal relations that are proper to imagination. Superstition, and sometimes philosophy, accepts imagination as a truer avenue to knowledge than its contact with things, but this is precisely what I endeavor to avoid by distinguishing matter, or the substance of dynamic things from essence, or the direct datum, sensuous, or intelligible of intuition. Intuition represents the free life of the mind, the poetry native to it, which I am far from despising, but this is the subjective or ideal element in thought which we must discount if we are anxious to possess true knowledge. In saying, then, that my philosophy is ancient, I do not mean that it is traditional or reactionary. On the contrary, it is as personally skeptical and independent as I am able to make it although I think it reasonable to suppose that the beliefs that prove inevitable for me after absolutely disinterested criticism would prove inevitable also to most human beings. The trouble is that for them many other beliefs and superstitions prove inevitable also, and they take their first principles to be no more fundamental than their accidental prejudices. Moreover, if they are professional philosophers or inspired prophets, they may even embrace some decidedly secondary and accidental notion as alone requisite or true. 
and in its name they will then contradict their own inevitable first principles. So in the interest of idealism, they may verbally deny the existence of matter, for in the vortex of romanticism they may flout the reality of truth. Yet they are plainly heretics, since they retract the primary presuppositions of intelligence implied in their own arguments. The sum of all that I find myself compelled to assume is not large, and the endless investigation of the field that I see open before me I frankly abandon to more diligent or more competent inquirers. I am no scientific man, no mathematician, no historian, so that the details of the realms of matter, essence, and truth extend in all directions far beyond my ken, and that I do not pretend to foresee what may be eventually discovered there. Even in the sphere of morals and politics, where I feel more at home, I do not wander in this book beyond the rudiments, because it is only the rudiments that an individual can discover by analyzing his own passions. In primitive societies, where custom is sacred, and the passions are all choral and collective, unless sneakingly criminal, it is still the individual that is gregarious and swayed by the mood of the little circle in which he moves and which forms the whole world for his conscience. Whether we remain childishly gregarious or become at moments childishly petulant and conceited is again an individual question. There is no human nature except in particular men and no social power except over individuals. If society evolves, it does so by obeying or imposing a change of habit in the animal psyches of its members. Such mutations are provoked by men of action or announced prophetically by men of genius, who possess unusual insight into the interplay between human nature and the material conditions of life. The task I have undertaken here is at once more modest and more intimate. I study only the revelation made inwardly to the spirit, while the psyche undergoes those material mutations or asserts itself among them. For besides governing the organism and its action, the psyche feels what it does and what it suffers, and this inner echo of all that happens in the body in its contacts with surrounding things I call the life of spirit. It is evidently only as affecting the spirit and as enlightening the spirit that a rational moralist need consider the world. An animal psyche as complex and as delicately organized as the human, the spirit has a wider basis and comes to light in more ways and in more places than we might at first suspect. And at each point where it flowers at all, it flowers into something original. The ear yields one unprecedented character to the sum of existence in yielding sound, and the eye another unprecedented element in yielding visual light and color. The same organic machinery in other places and emotions yields the unprecedented elements of pleasure and pain in all the emotions, nor is the originality of the pigments the whole originality in the spiritual picture. Memory lights up perspective which in nature can subsist only as dead relations between dead facts, and expectation, contradiction, doubt, and surprise vivify the mechanism of instinct and turn plodding existence into a series of comedies. It is only by being reported through the senses to the spirit that the world puts on this wedding garment and it can be admitted to the feast of life. We should never become poets in the end, had we not been essentially poets from the beginning. There is a strange servility in conventional sentiment on this subject. People admire the mind as a most opportune and useful servant of the body, to warn it of dangers and opportunities, and to guide it in constructing artificial instruments. In nature, I suppose that nothing arises for the sake of anything else, but everything only when other things permit and favor it. Thus, mind in particular seems to awaken animals when they become physically capable of long-range reactions upon surrounding events. 
and this extension of life over a web, as it were, of aerial relations. In the act of giving birth to intelligence becomes, for the observer from without, evidence that intelligence has been born. We may even, if we like, give the name of intelligence directly to this aerial organization of material motions, ignoring for the moment the inner side of life. But this use or abuse of language will not abolish the actuality of consciousness in each animal on those occasions, much less will it determine the moral question whether we shall prize mind for its utility in serving matter or matter for its utility in serving mind. In any case, before there was mind, nothing could have been created with malice prepense, least of all mind itself. For evidently, before there was consciousness, there would not have been an idea of consciousness or any insight into its possible uses if introduced into the interstices of material events. Anything capable of being so introduced and of having such uses would seem to me not to deserve the name of mind at all, but to be, by definition, a material agent. That may be only a question of words. What I should say without hesitation is that from mental life, the body and the world cannot be dispensed with. From physical and social health comes the very existence of mind and all its happiness. Yet the only use of health and of a good social regimen is to permit the mind to flourish more freely. What is this free life of mind? What are the necessary and sufficient things that may occupy it? What troubles does it suffer from? When do they vanish? And in what, then, may it find a positive joy? Such are the questions that ultimately concern me in this book. Romantic souls who think that spirit is an unharnessed pegasus tumbling among the clouds will find nothing here to their purpose. The great characteristic of the human spirit as I see it is its helplessness and misery, most miserable and helpless when it fancies itself dominant and independent, and the great problem for it is salvation, purification, rebirth into a humble recognition of the powers on which it depends, and into a sane enjoyment of its appropriate virtues. Such salvation and rebirth must come by gift of nature, but they are not impossible. On the contrary, they tend to be re-established automatically through the self-elimination of extreme madness and the natural fertility of health. At any moment, spirit unexpectedly flowers. A little earth and a little sunshine are sufficient for it. It overflows in the play of children, as in the wit and wisdom of mature minds, for spirit may readily overcome the world without doing it violence by transmuting it into terms of art, of love, and of reflection.